Hey there, how's it going? Uh, my name is Josh, I'm one of the pastors here at ABF. We know that there are a number of different people that tune in both near and far. We know that uh, there are some of you that are just traveling, miss the weekend services, and so therefore you're tuning in online. We also know that there's others of you that are around the country and even around the world that are tuning in uh, just to get some good Bible teaching, just diving into God's word. And we would just say, man, our heart is that everybody would be connected to a local Bible body of believers that meets together in real life. Um, don't get me wrong. It's great that you're coming here and getting into God's word. And I think that's amazing. But man, our hope is that you would be a part of a local church. And so uh, we're very happy to su supply this. But man, that's our heart for anybody and everybody watching. We just wanted to put that out there as we get started. A couple of things. Uh, if there's anything we can pray for you about this week, we would love to do that. You can text any prayer request to 97,000 and we will pray for you this week. If you're interested in any of the things that are going on locally here at this body of believers in Agora Hills, California, go ahead and check out the website, agorabible.org, or get the app. We have a church center app and find Agora Bible Fellowship. All the information of things that are going on, you can check out there. Finally, thank you so much uh, for prayerfully considering uh, financially supporting all the ministries that are happening here. Literally, we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't have our doors open. We couldn't put on these uh, videos and uh, be sharing God's word via online messages like this without people like you that give. So thank you so much for um, prayerfully considering that. We appreciate your partnership in that. That being said, why don't we just get into God's word together. Let's go. Well, greetings online church family. Thanks for joining us for another uh, chance to dive into God's word. Glad you're uh, making the decision to invest in your spiritual life and excited to be in this new series that Josh started uh, last week in this titled Powerful Prayers and looking at different uh, examples of powerful prayer in scripture. And there's lessons in these different accounts about prayer but then there's also lessons just in, in general about how life works and how we interact with God, how we interact with each other, and uh, some stuff also that's going to be uncovered just about internal stuff going on in our lives. And this week in particular, I would say there's one big idea that I'm hoping is coming through in the account of Paul and Silas's story, is this idea, the big idea is this, that internal attitudes can impact external circumstances. We're going to see that firsthand and really come to understand that what's going on internally literally translates and impacts our external circumstances, whether we realize it or not. There's a, a professor uh, at the university, uh, at Northwestern University named Vicki Medvek, who uh, studied different Olympic athletes. And in her study and their uh, their response to performance, she discovered that those uh, that had gotten uh, bronze medals were typically happier with their performance than those who had gotten silver medals. Kind of interesting, the more she dug into it, she discovered that the, the silver medalists had a really hard time processing because they felt they were so close to getting the gold. So they were left with disappointment and uh, what could have been. But the bronze medalist in her study, she discovered they were thrilled because they had the opposite mindset. They were just happy that they somehow made it on the podium. They realized how close they weren't, uh, they came to not meddling at all. Now, if it was just based on performance, obviously the silver medalist every single time has done or performed better than the bronze medalist. But we see how attitude impacts one's own reality. You think about that, that exter internal attitude really heavily plays a big role in how we perceive our own circumstances, how we, the lens in which we see reality with. If you think about that, you've all encountered somebody that it seems like, man, doesn't matter what happens to them, the way that they see life, they're always positive. 
was thinking about that in my own uh, family's life. My uh, mom in her early 30s was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I don't know if I've shared that here before, but it's a pretty traumatic thing for our family and a pretty big deal for my dad, my mom, obviously a lot going on with that. But it's interesting because even in the, the middle of that, she always just stayed kind of just, you'd say, strangely positive. She just had an unbelievable outlook and just filled with joy regardless, um, I would say in retrospect, because of a, a significant relationship with the Lord. But my remember growing up how my dad would tease her about, man, calling her Pollyanna, just always up about things. And think about that in contrast to the person that you've met that's always negative about stuff even when they should have an outlook of, man, just grateful and thankful. I had a friend tell me the story about overhearing his boss at work complaining about his income taxes. And it was interesting because he mentioned in his complaint the dollar amount that he owed in income taxes. My friend was like, wait a second. It's hard to feel sympathy for this guy when the amount he owed on income taxes exceeded my friend's income. He's like, ah, I'm not giving you much sympathy. You see, perspective and attitude obviously weighs heavily into the way in which, the lens in which we see things around us. Here's one of the reasons why that we have a tendency to focus either on the good or on the bad is because what we often find, what we often land on, we find what we're looking for. What do I mean by that? It's basically what happens is we typically come up with a hypothesis, a, a, our outlook about something before it actually takes place. And then we're looking for evidence to support that hypothesis, this, this idea. That, so the person that's, uh, we'll use an example of a relationship. If once you have a hypothesis about somebody, you're like, you might determine, man, I just don't like that person. Well, what happens there? Once you have that thought about them, man, you're just constantly looking for anything negative, completely distracted and not even catching anything positive. I see that so often in marriages that are derailed is once somebody has a, sees the, the, their spouse through a negative lens, it's really hard to come back from that because it's already programmed in their mind to only see the negative. Now you see in relationships, you see the opposite side of the spectrum where somebody, once they've decided somebody is great, they're completely blinded to all the red flags, all the things that should be warning them to stay away. Knowing this, this tendency, it's kind of a, something that's seen all across of psychology. They actually have a term for it or expression. It's called premeditated cognitive commitments. In other words, we premeditate, we've decided what, what our commitment is. Basically, we're, we're, we find what we're looking for because it's already decided in our mind. Now, one thing, the reason I spend so much time talking about this is one thing that we can do in our spiritual life that I think is beneficial that we see in the story that we're about to look at with Paul and Silas is you can predetermine that you're going to worship God regardless of, of your circumstances, that you're going to cling to his goodness and his sovereignty and the fact that he has your best interest in mind, regardless of what life throws at you. And I would suggest, man, that is a much better way to live. When we actually flip the script and make the choice to focus on the positives rather than the negatives, that's the difference I would suggest between a, a worshiper and a complainer let me pray before we look at our text today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this chance to spend some time in your word and seeing examples of powerful prayer demonstrated in scripture, old and new. The impact that it has to, to change things, to transform things internally, externally. Man, I love the power that's at the disposal of the believer that can enter into your throne room. God, we ask now, even with that in mind, that you would just be doing a work on us, just shaping our, our minds, our mindset, because we understand how important attitude is. And if we get this area right, man, it could really impact every aspect of our lives. God, we ask that you teach us through this section of scripture. We invite that in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
All right, well, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 16 and starting in verse 16 and giving you a little uh, summary of where we're at in the account of Acts. We're on a, a missionary adventure that Paul is having in the city of Philippi. It's taking place with both him and Silas in the account where they're going from city to city to evangelize, to introduce people to the love and grace that's offered through Jesus Christ. A little bit about Philippi, it was a Roman colony. It was known for a couple different things. It was known for its uh, uh, being a, a primary military base. It was known for its just economic achievements. It was a political center. And really, the positionally, it was a gateway into Europe. And so that's where they're heading into this city, wanting to have an influence and impact on the people there for Christ. We'll start in verse 16 of chapter 16. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. All right, we'll stop there. What's going on? Basically, as I mentioned, coming into this town, first they'd start trying to reach out to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So it begins in the place of prayer. And then as they're, they're heading there, as they're heading to the, the synagogue or the place of prayer in that, that situation, they're introduced to a, to a slave girl who we're told is possessed by a demon. I find it interesting in scripture how often, if you think about it, it makes reference to someone being demon possessed. It's uh, something that's uh, uh, not uncommon in the, the New Testament, Old Testament, but it's interesting today how rarely we equate anything to having involvement with a demon or the spiritual world. It's interesting because it's not as if the de demons have left the planet. They're still active and involved. We've just given different titles to things, unfortunately, the reality is what I've seen over 26 years of vocational ministry is that there is a spiritual battle going on behind the scenes and it's significant. I've seen some of it firsthand. I, I never forget a time that in, uh, back in Chicago working at, uh, with young adults, we had a young adult uh, woman that was on one of the retreats that were leading at, a, at the camp that uh, we, the church was connected to. And at that camp during the time of worship, this girl ran out of the room and just kind of a, a, a bit of a panic. And so myself and one of the other leaders went to check to see what was happening with her. We found her strangely convulsing and talking in this like deep demonic voice. It was a really uh, just crazy situation. We started praying over her. And while we were praying over her, she actually stood up started running, and it's hard to explain what the setting is at the camp, but basically it was a, a couple-tier uh, building, and she, she, there was a section that had an overlook of this rock climbing wall that was about 60 feet high. She started sprinting and goes to jump head first off this basically cliff, you would say, and God's kindness, he allowed me in a full sprint to jump and actually grab her by the ankles uh, and with this other leader getting to hold her down till we can kind of calm her and get the, some assistance. And it was a very traumatic experience and there was nothing that anyone could ever try to convince me of anything was involved with it other than demonic activity. It was a for sure something where someone's, man, he has gotten a grip, gotten a foothold in this poor young girl's life and mind and heart. And so here's the, the thing for us to be aware that the enemy that is, is working and moving in the, spiritual, in the spiritual world, and it definitely translates and impacts what we're dealing with present day. It's not just in horror movies, it's a reality, not just in that culture, but present day as well. There's some truth in the statement by Charles Boldmere who says the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world 
that he didn't exist. In that day, demonic uh, mediums is what they t- called them, would have been very common. It'd be something of a sort, kind of like a, a fortune teller. We're told that they gained that her owner, she was a slave, gained much income because of her ability to fortune tell because of her demonic connections, because of her involvement there. It's interesting to think, uh, even in the accounts in scripture, this was a common way for somebody to try to gain wisdom or input about their future, uh, making decisions. Even uh, King Saul, we're told, visited a medium in an attempt uh, to lean into the demonic. So this uh, demon-possessed girl is basically following Paul around like a lost puppy doll, dog. And what does it say that she says? She keeps repeating, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It's interesting because there's actually, it's a true statement. They were servants of the Most High God and they were proclaiming the only way to salvation through Jesus Christ. So she's proclaiming and presenting truth, but definitely creepy. And here's the problem is they wouldn't want any necessarily association with someone that is possessed by a demon. It's not good for a reputation. It'd be as if we had a a Satan worshiper doing introductions uh, here at the church. That's not exactly what you're looking for. So we're told that after days of this, imagine that, days of her just repeating this anywhere you went, we're told that Paul was greatly annoyed Greatly annoyed. I have to be honest with you, I did find some uh, solace in the fact that a minister can get greatly annoyed at something, and that's what we're told takes place here. But he demonstrates in response just a, just a powerful display of God's power by demanding in the name of Jesus Christ that this, that this demon leave this poor slave girl. And obviously, in the the power of Jesus' name, there's no response other than obedience. The the demon actually does do exactly that and leaves her. It's a great reminder for us of what is taught in 1 John 4, 4, that he that is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So it's important for us to be aware of the spiritual world, but to understand that who we have, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, is greater than who is in the world. It's not something for us to fear, but for us to be aware of, to be alert that there is an enemy that's lurking, looking to destroy. We see what the response, though, is and what happens after they confront this darkness. Verse 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks." Wow, quite a response. You see here, basically what's happened is after setting this sweet servant girl, or slave girl free from the bondage of, de- of these demons or a demon, we see that her handlers or her owners, which is even sad to even say that, says that they're mad. And the reason they're upset is because their potential for financial gain has been shot. It's so crazy to think how often the, out of the, the root issue of greed, somebody is willing to, uh, to do whatever it takes, taking advantage of the marginalized or the kids. It's kind of a, a sick thing that was back then and unfortunately carries even over to today, that reality. But in this context, we see they're upset so much so that they start to stir up opposition. If you think about it, it's never been a hard thing to get the masses fired up with false information, and that's exactly what happens here. 
So then it mentions the, the leaders. Basically, in any Roman town, they had what was called a magistrate. They actually had two magistrates for every single city. And the magistrates basically kept law and order and were kind of the, the governing body of that particular town. So often wanting to keep the peace. But we see what they demonstrate here. Basically, not without any kind of a legal proceeding, they take Paul and Silas, stripped, which uh, would have been a, a shameful act, and then beaten with rods and thrown into prison. Luke, our author here, emphasizes that it was done with many blows. I don't know what that would have been like. I would imagine in and of itself of extremely traumatic experience for both of them. We're told that they were put in the inner part of the prison to eliminate any possibility of escape. And they even had stocks on their feet. So imagine this, picture this, what they've displayed or found in prisons from that time period is they'd basically have basically chains coming from the concrete wall coming down off of that and attached to someone's ankles so that their ankles, their, their legs would actually be spread apart and then held up on an angle. So all of the weight of their, of their, all of their weight would be supported on nothing but really just their back. So imagine being beaten, stripped, attached to a wall, kind of a, the, the worst possible uh, imaginable experience. Remember when my kids were little, we used to read them a book titled Alexander and the Horrible, Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Thinking about that when I was thinking about reflecting on this situation, this is Paul and Silas's Horrible, Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. How in the world in the midst of that are you able to focus on anything possible? It seems like it's almost not even human to be able to expect that. But here's the thing is what they were able to do is something that we're invited to as well is to zoom out and see the bigger picture and not be entangled in the circumstances right before us. Like the story of a college student writing home to her parents. She says, dear mom and dad, I have so much to tell you because of the fire in my dorm set off by student riots. I experienced temporary lung damage and had to go to the hospital. While I was there, I fell in love with an orderly and we have moved in together. I dropped out of school when I found out I was pregnant and he got fired because of his drinking. So we're going to move to Alaska where we might get married after the birth of our baby. Your loving daughter, P.S. None of this really happened, but I did flunk my chemistry class and I wanted you to keep it in perspective. You see, she was reminding them of seeing things from the bigger picture. Maybe the failure in chemistry class wasn't such a big deal when you think of the other possibilities. Paul and Silas are obviously, we're going to see, able to keep things in the right perspective. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly... There was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone, everyone's bonds were unfastened. All right, we'll stop there. Basically what's happening is first thing to point to is what they're choosing to do despite their circumstances. As I already pointed to, this is the worst possible day. They're arrested. There's no court process. They're beaten. They're, they're, they're attached by the ankles to the wall. They've got all of this going on. And what do they choose to do? They choose worship. Their internal attitude impacted their external circumstances, as I pointed to earlier. Basically, complainers can always find something to complain about, but worshipers can always find something to praise God about. Here's the thing. The pessimist in us says, well, wait a second. Isn't worship in the middle of hardship kind of just faking it? Is that even real? But here's the thing to understand is they're not celebrating the bad circumstance. Let's be clear on that. They're not saying, oh, I'm so glad this happened to me. That's not at all what's happening. Basically, it's a trust exercise. Instead, they're celebrating their sovereign God and what they know to be true about his character. 
They're continuing to put their eyes on him, basically trusting that he's at work behind the scenes. Was this easy to do? Absolutely not. But I imagine as they start doing it, there would have been refreshment. I, I, I imagine God met them in their place of need because they chose to have this attitude going in. I was reading this week, Holocaust, Holocaust survivor Victor Frankel is quoted as saying, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last human freedoms to choose, the ha last human freedom is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. You see, the choice to trust is ours. Do we choose to trust despite our circumstances and what we know about our God? We know that we have a God that rescues. We know that we have a God that heals. We know that we have a God who vindicates. We know that we have a God that makes beautiful things out of ashes. So we're told that they are praying and singing hymns to God. I like the combination between those two things. Praying, obviously, uh, it can be petition, it can be adoration, it can be any of those things. But worship, it's usually just celebrating God. If you think about what worship is, I like to think of it as musical prayer. You're, you're just adding notes of music to what you're trying to tell and express to our God. It's a beautiful opportunity for us to see even our times of worship as musical prayer. If you think about it, really, what's the alternative in this circumstance? You, you really, the alternative is complaining. Anybody that started to go down that route, where does that take us? Leaves us bitter and angry and all the things we deserved and haven't gotten. That, that's not a healthy choice. So instead, what are they choosing? They're saying, we're going to, despite our circumstance, choose to praise our God. Imagine what that would have been like in the prison there. There's, they're obviously not the only prisoners in the prison. They're there singing. I'm, I'm wondering what it would have sounded like. It's late at night. They're singing. They've just been beat up. They're hanging from their ankles, basically. Do you think by interpretation, by voting, do you, do you think that it would have been a, a pleasant sounding uh, voices? Or do you think it would have been a little raspy and a little off key, but full of passion? I love that picture of these, these men being at the place where they're like, you know what, we're just going to sing our lungs out regardless of what's happening here. Their audience, I imagine, would have said, whatever they have, whatever's setting them apart, I want some of that. I need that in my life. My wife uh, had her birthday this past week and some friends of hers from her life group and uh, here on staff surprised her meeting at, her at a restaurant. It's kind of funny. You can see the picture here. They actually all bought wigs to match her bad uh, uh, 90s haircut. And you can see kind of what they, what they look like here. It's kind of funny because she was telling me afterwards that a bunch of people at the restaurant came up and they heard them just having a, having a blast, enjoying themselves. They're like, hey, whatever is going on here, I want to be a part of that. Picture the exact same thing with Paul and Silas. Whatever's going on here, I imagine everybody surrounding it would have been, man, I want to be a part of that. I want some of whatever you have going on. But here's the important thing to understand when we're kind of bringing some clarity to how prayer works. It's more than just an attractive faith to those around. Their choice to worship set off a chain reaction. It changes, it changed the spiritual atmosphere. It set the table for the miraculous. What are we told happens? We're told that an earthquake started. This wasn't coincidence. Oh yeah, oh, strangely, there's just an earthquake. Their worship was the catalyst that moved in God's heart. He stirs and decreates an earthquake. It's interesting. It's part of that, you're kind of like, well, was that just coincidence? I don't think so. But then you actually see some of the supernatural things that are taking place as well. No earthquake is causing every door to open. No earthquake is causing every bond to be unfastened. That's not how earthquakes work. You see, God was on the move in response to their worship. Isn't it interesting to think that our attitude 
during difficult times has the potential to unleash the miraculous for God to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what they have going on there and I'm going to demonstrate my power through them. You see, we can set the table by our attitude and by our choice for our God to move and do the miraculous. It's something cool to glean from their story. It's interesting as you look in verse 27, how everyone around was drawn to them. It says, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. When he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. We'll pause there. Pretty powerful, epic response here. Look what happens. Basically, out of their choice to worship despite their circumstances, huge earthquake, as we mentioned, prisoners set free. But then here's the thing that I wanted to point out. Once their bonds are released and their doors are open, what would be the natural tendency for prisoners? Man, you got a shot at this at getting set free. Who knows? Many of them had probably been in there for years. They have the opportunity to run for their lives, but instead, they all stick around for this worship concert. You see, when there's someone that has genuine faith that is authentically worshiping God despite their miserable circumstances, there's something where the world takes notice, and they do. So much so that they, that they stick around. But here's what's interesting, is the, the guy that's, the, the, that's managing the, the prison there, we're told that he's about to kill himself. Now you might say, well, why would he be about to kill himself? Well, he would assume once the doors are open, man, he's in big trouble and because all of his prisoners that he's responsible for, I imagine his life depended on it, would have actually been lost. So he's thinking either I take my life or my authorities take it for me. But Paul in his kindness yells out and says, don't, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. It's interesting to see what the, the, the uh, man's response was. He's trying to make sense out of us. We're told that he was fearful. We don't know if he's afraid of the prisoners or that, are, that are now set loose, that he's maybe mistreated over the years, or maybe he's just afraid of what he knows is going on, that the God that they're worshiping has been on the move. And that's what I'd lean towards because look at his que question. He says, man, how can I be saved? In other words, all that we've been saying up to this is, in other words, what you have, I want some of that. And the first thing off the lips, off their lips is pointing to the rescue that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Still the same exact message that we have 2,000 years later. Man, the only way that you can be saved, that you can have that kind of faith that can endure whatever is thrown at it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's only possible by humbling yourself and calling out to him for rescue. And that's exactly what we're told after explanation. That's exactly what they're we're told happens. We're told that his whole family is saved and baptized at that time of night. It's kind of a cool picture. So you got this worship concert in the middle of the night. Then you have a baptism service, a big feast. I mean, talk about God taking something and flipping the script. In other words, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it and did something good. And so my question for you is, was their faith, their trust, their hope that was placed in God, was it vindicated? Was it proven? What did he prove? Did he disappoint in any way? 
Now, sure, yes, you could say, man, they went through some difficult stuff. God has never promised that we're going to skip difficult things. But would they at the end of the day, seeing a whole family, and probably it doesn't mention, but I'm guessing a revival amongst the prisoners too, would they have said, was it worth it? Absolutely. That was, I imagine, the foundation for the church there in Philippi. God was on the move and that's how he started. I imagine the entire region would have heard of these miraculous things on the other side of this. So, in conclusion, it's interesting to think that the outcome of your life may be determined by the outlook in which you have. My question for us is, are you remaining positive despite your circumstances? Are you clinging to the sovereignty and goodness of our God? Or are you getting swept up in the here and now? Woe is me, complaining. Man, you can flip the script. You can make the choice to remain positive, keep worshiping, regardless of how crazy our life gets. I want to leave you with this quote that I heard this week by Christine Kane. She said, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. God's hope and desire for us, even in the darkest days, is that we actually come out and demonstrate him the superiority of doing life with him to the world around us. Let me pray as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this text and this picture and the unbelievable demonstration of trust and faith. And you prove yourself time and time again to be worthy of that trust, especially on display here with Paul and Silas. We thank you for the chance to celebrate that, to point to you, to to see your majesty on display, your power demonstrated, your way that you can take something miserable and make something beautiful out of it, God. I thank you for that family. I look forward to meeting that entire family that got saved there someday in prison. Such a cool story. We praise you now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.